Well, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Uh, today, we're pleased to bring you this month's installment in the 2021 E4C seminar series. For those of you who are new to the series, uh, the series aims to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. We host a new research institution monthly to learn about their work in advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and more. Today's seminar is going to be presented by Dr. Darshan Karwat, who is at the School for the Future of Innovation and the Polytechnic School, Polytechnic School at Arizona State University and also represents the Constellation Prize. My name is Jana Aranda, and I am the director of the Engineering Global Development Group at the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and also the president of Engineering for Change. The seminar you're participating in today will be archived on E4C site and on our YouTube channel. Both of the URLs for the are listed on the page right now. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, we encourage you to contact the E4C team at research and engineering for change. Org. We also invite you to share your feedback at the end of the seminar to inform our strategy. Uh, there's a link listed on the slide right now, but you will also uh, be getting that through the chat. And if you're joining us on Twitter today, uh, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Seminar Series. The seminar series was launched by Dr. Jesse Austin Brennerman, who is also going to be our co-moderator for today's seminar. And he leads our ASME's Engineering Global Development Research Committee. Um, as you'll see, he has an incredible bio with a tremendous experience across a variety of sectors. Uh, but currently he is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan. So uh, you'll hear more from Jesse towards our Q&A. Now, before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about E4C and who we are. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, a prior art database of over 1,000 essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. We invite you to visit our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. Now, E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by E4C research fellows annually on behalf of our partners and sponsors and delivered as digestible insights, um, reports with implementable insights. We invite you to visit our research page. The URL is listed on the slide to explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review the State of Engineering for Global Development, a compilation of academic programs and institutions that offer training in this sector. If you have a research question or want to work with us on a research project, as a research fellow, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. Now, in addition to the good work that we do in, in research and academia, we also at ASME host a hardware-led social innovation accelerator called the iShow. The iShow happens annually in India, Kenya, the United States, and is open to anyone taking a physical product to market with the objective of gaining social and environmental impact. iShow is, uh, iShow applications are currently closed for our iShow events in India and Kenya. However, iShow USA applications are open until May 3rd. So we invite you to uh, submit applications if you have a, a prototype that you've already developed. Um, if you're interested in receiving the technical design guidance, as well as connections from our expert network, meeting peers in the space, gaining seed funding, and um, 
generally having an incredible time. So I uh, really invite you all heartily to join us if you are a social entrepreneur taking hardware to market. In addition to that, in, in terms of events that are coming up that we want to extend an invitation to you, we have a virtual side event alongside the sixth annual multi-stakeholder forum uh, hosted by the United Nations on science, technology, and innovation for the SDGs. Uh, this will be on May 3rd at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, and it's going to focus on fostering ecosystems for impact, and in particular, the role of enabling technologies for advancing human infrastructure. You are all very welcome to join us at that event. Registration is available now and entirely free, so uh, do check out that page uh, to join us at that event as well. Now, um, we're going to take a few moments just to, to meet our audience. Uh, we want to know where you are in the world. So please do use the chat window, which is located to the bottom right of your screen to type in your location. I'll get us started here. Um, here, well, we already have uh, folks from Mexico. I'm here in Brooklyn, Houston, Texas, uh, Calgary, uh, Michigan, Jerusalem, Colorado and Phoenix, Ann Arbor and California. Um, San Miguel Allende, love that place. Eugene and Stuttgart, uh, Tucson, which I finally learned how to say as opposed to Tucson, San Diego, um, and Denver, uh, Ohio and DC. Brilliant. Welcome from the UK and Spain. So lovely to have you all joining us today. Uh, it's, it's really brilliant to have such a diverse audience who is interested in learning about activist engineering. So welcome. All right, welcome, welcome everyone. So just with that in mind, uh, we do encourage you to use ch ch the chat window to make any remarks to your fellow attendees, um, as well as um, if you have any pr questions that you have for the admins of the webinar, you can send them a private uh, chat. During the seminar, we encourage you to use the Q&A window to um, type in any questions you have for the presenter so we can really keep track of those and not lose anyone. So welcome everyone again from DC to Nigeria and uh, um, more. We're so eager to jump into today's topic. So I'm going to go ahead and start by introducing our incredible speaker. Uh, Darshan Karwat is an assistant professor with a joint appointment at the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and the Polytechnic School at ASU, where he runs Re Engineered, an interdisciplinary group that embeds environmental projection, social justice, and peace in engineering. Karwat is originally from Mumbai, India, uh, but is also at home in Michigan and Washington, D.C. He studied aerospace engineering and sustainability ethics at the University of Michigan, and then spent three years as a AAAS fellow in Washington, DC, first at the US Environmental Protection Agency on the innovation team, where he worked on climate change resilience and low cost air pollution sensors, and then at the US Department of Energy in the Water Power Technologies Office, helping design and run the Wave Energy Prize. And we're actually very excited because we're working with uh, NREL as well in the Water Power Technologies Office. Darshan also works as a co-founder of the Constellation Prize, and um, he has a particular passion for soccer, as I'm sure many of our listeners do today. So with that, Darshan, I'm going to turn it over to you to present to our attendees. Welcome, Darshan. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm very grateful that E4C um, is a space that is willing to engage with the kinds of ideas that, that I've been thinking about for the past few years. Um, thank you, Yana. Uh, Yesi, Jesse, Yesi, and uh, Marilyn. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, just give me a thumbs up to let me know that you can see it. All right. Let's continue. Okay, great. And... You do you see works. a blue, a beautiful starry sky like you're camping, but do not see the slides yet. There we go. Now? We see them now. Beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you. As an aerospace engineer, I care about engineering. As a human, I care about what engineering means to society and the earth. If we take seriously the premise that engineering should promote environmental protection, social justice, peace, and human rights, and you can absolutely disagree with me about any of that, 
But if you do agree, uh, then I would argue that we are far, far from that reality. And I wanna take on this challenge about imagining and building an engineering profession that is motivated by these ideas of environmental protection, peace, justice, and human rights by using the lens of what I've been calling activist engineering. Now, if you feel uncomfortable with that term, I hope my talk will make you feel a little bit differently about it and hopefully a little bit more empowered by that term. And again, I just wanna thank Yana, uh, Jesse, and Marilyn for creating this space for me. I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, so what I'm, I'm really trying to do is basically set up a conversation because as I have grown in age and I'm not that old, I have fewer and fewer answers day by day. I just have more and more questions about things. And I, so I wanna learn from you about how we might think more critically and strategically about what it might take to create a more thriving and vibrant engineering profession that more directly advances these causes of environmental protection, justice, human rights, and peace. And this is the key, at larger and larger scales. This is the opposite of the kind of engineering where the benefits of our work trickles down to those, who, and that, that includes non-humans, who need it the most. And I think this it is entirely reasonable to think about and try to create. So what I'm gonna do is set up some context, define some key terms, um, and present some premises and a proposition to provoke conversation. In the end, I care about conversation. So I will do, um, I'll do what I can to infuse some of the research that my lab group reengineered has been doing, as well as the research and writing of others. I don't have to go back home to Mumbai, India to find technological inequality and its interplay with poverty and environmental injustice and marginalization. Um, I simply have to walk the streets of the city that I live in right now, Phoenix, Arizona, where many still have inadequate access to energy services in the desert summers that are getting hotter and hotter. You could go to San Francisco. I could go to San Francisco where tech fuel gentrification and rising poverty has shocked even the UN's poverty expert, Philip Alston, who's seen poverty all over the world. I could go to Detroit, whose planning and cars helped create not only an American middle class, but also urban sprawl and inertia for mitigating climate change. Or I could go to Hale County in the south uh, of, of the United States in the Black Belt of Alabama, where even today, vast swaths of homes aren't even built to code. So I, you know, I recognize that many uh, of, of those, many of you joining us are from all over the world. And oftentimes um, it's, you know, it's kind of surprising to think that the challenges that we think about existing elsewhere exist in the United States. Um, so the legacy of engineering is not only full of awe-inspiring achievements like refrigeration and computing and lasers and getting to the moon, but it's also full of mountaintop removal and poisoned waters and racism and the continued development of the capacity to destroy life and the earth. So while these are certainly issues of social policy, there are also issues of engineering, technology, and science policy. They are issues of what we consider important to invest in technically. And I'll go further and say that they are also issues of how we as engineers justify to ourselves the work that we do. It's about our stake in the world that we build. Now, many times people will blame politicians and governments and the market, whatever that is, for the technically driven problems that the world faces. And you can think about war, or climate change, or surveillance, disinformation, and on and on and on. But why is it that there are almost always engineers and corporations that are willing to design and build those technologies that cause those problems? Many times in spite of knowing about the negative consequences of those technologies. So to spark debate and reflection and action in response to this perceived reality of mine, I started writing about what I call activist engineering when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan. Um, and I'll define this term activist engineering a little bit later. So a bit of context before I, I really dive in. I wanna situate my remarks in um, the context of history, some current findings and research that we're doing and I think the scale of the conversation, the, the challenge that I think needs to be um, confronted. So um, there's an increasing body of work that is showing that engineering um, uh, and the way in which we 
train engineers is creating what is called a culture of disengagement. And there's a seminal paper by Aaron Sek, who's a sociologist at the University of Michigan, who has written about this. Um, and I see Jesse nodding his, his head. Um, so she writes about how this culture of disengagement um, is founded on three ideological pillars, depoliticization, uh, the technical social dualism, and I'll actually give you an example of what I mean by the technical social dualism and meritocracy. So here's, a, here's an example of the technical social dualism. And this is a quote from an engineer who, who um, is part of a team uh, that uh, bid on building uh, the, uh, or expanding, I should say, the border wall between the United States and Mexico. So this, this is an engineering project, engineering firms bid for this project, and here's a, here's a quote from one of the managers that bid on this project. Quote, there could be a political backlash, but we are in business to make money and put people to work and provide a good service, whether it's a wall or a substation or airport or prison. We don't want to approach it from a political standpoint, only from a business standpoint. Now you can see how that quote is reflective of the way in which engineers oftentimes create this barrier in their minds between the technical work that they do and the social implications of that work. And that's kind of what Aaron Sek is getting at regarding the technical social dualism. So that's just one example of an increasing body of work that is talking about this culture of disengagement. The next couple of things relate to some of the work that we've been doing in my lab group. Um, so uh, I care a lot about getting engineers to engage uh, with people who lack access to engineering services. And what we've been doing is understanding um, uh, through surveys and interviews um, how engineers feel about doing this kind of work, about you know, serving in places where uh, there is a lack of access, as well as from the standpoint of community groups in the United States um, that uh, would like to collaborate with engineers. And again, I, 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 uh, the work that I've done so far has focused on the US context, but I think the, the findings that we have are probably generally applicable no matter where you are. Um, so uh, first related to barriers, um, you know, engineers report uh, that there are several barriers to uh, their doing work for communities that lack access to these services. A lack of rapport with the kind of people that they wanna serve or engage with, the lack of knowledge on how to do it, the time that's necessary, the funds, you know, those are sort of standard things that come up time and again. There's a couple of other interesting things related to how this work just is unrecognized. Like this work is not valued in the same way that, you know, being part of a team designing a blowout preventer for an oil well gets you recognized, right? And there's also this notion of what we're calling a collaboration burden. Basically doing this kind of work is intensive in a different kind of way. And I can say a little bit more about that later. At the same time, in spite of the barriers that engineers identify, there is a strong desire and potential for this work. Engineers time and again say, we want it more valued and recognized. We need more institutional structures to recognize this work, yada, 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 okay? So there's a couple papers that we have written that are focused on this. And I, I would be remiss to not talk about the historical context here. When we think about the politics of engineering, um, we need to remember that people for many, many decades have been raising the same questions that I'm raising. So in many ways, the, the work that I'm doing is not particularly original, right? Like people have been talking about this for a long time. You can read books by Leighton who um, you know, wrote about the revolt of engineers some wonderful work by Matthew Wisniewski uh, in a book called Engineers for Change. Um, and you know, the work of Gwen Odinger has been as, as particularly inspirational to me, the way in which she thinks about how engineers think about the work they do. So there's a long historical context there. And one example of the way in which um, people have taken these questions very seriously, um, uh, uh, I'll provide. So in the, in the 1960s, um, during the height of the anti-Vietnam War movement in the United States, um, the MIT Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, which at the time uh, was comprised of several full professors, assistant professors, postdoctoral fellows, maybe 20 graduate students, they decided that they did not want to do work that continued to support the military industrial complex. And so they changed the entire focus of the work that they did away from military applications to things like desalination and air pollution and stuff like that, 
right? So the same kinds of skills that they had apply to a completely different setting. Lastly, I'll say that the scale of the challenges that we're trying to address here are significant. I'm just gonna spend uh, uh, the next couple of slides are just to give you a sense of how widespread these challenges are um, just within the United States. So um, I care about issues of environment, climate, and energy, and I care about getting engineers and scientists um, engaged in those kinds of issues more directly. So what you see here is a map of a, a region of the United States that's called Appalachia, um, where there's a lot of uh, historically been a lot of coal mining, um, a lot of uh, uh, gas extraction. Um, and we interviewed five different community groups that you see in these different colors here that are spread across this geographic area called Appalachia. Um, these community groups have a different focus. They care about issues related to fracking, which if you're not familiar with that, it's basically um, a way in which natural gas that's trapped in rock formations is released and then, and then of course used. Um, community group B cares about watershed issues, C cares about health, uh, D cares about stewardship, environmental stewardship. Um, and then the last group cares about infrastructure, right? So you see these five groups in this broad geographic area. Um, and an assumption that I'm making is that the group, the, the concerns that these community groups care about um, uh, are in fact perhaps uh, concerns that people all across this wide geographic region care about, right? These are just community groups that have somehow organized and said that this is something that needs to be addressed, right? So again, there's on the order of 1.2 million different fracking wells across um, this geographic region, right? And a lot of these people lack access to engineering and scientific services in ways that could be helpful to them to um, address the environmental issues that they're facing, right? So again, this just gives you a sense of the scale of the problem across the United States. And you, again, it's translatable to perhaps um, your context as well. And when we talk to these community groups, um, uh, we've interviewed 47 of them so far. We've asked them like, what kinds of things do you want engineers and scientists to do with you, for you, right? And this is a, fair, a simplified version of a, a more complicated table uh, that's in a journal publication that's under review right now, which basically shows that it's, you know, all the kinds of things that engineers have traditionally done in whatever company they work for, whether they work for government, those are the same kinds of things that community groups care about as well. Different kinds of data collection, building online platforms, data analysis, mapping, formulating research questions, understanding causal analysis, like all of these kinds of things that engineers have traditionally done can be applied in contexts where our services are currently lacking. Okay, that's simply the point here. So I say all of this because we know that injustice and inequity exists and we know that engineers contribute to it. And to me, the more important question now is like, what do we do about it? Okay. We need to, we, uh, you know, recognizing that what we do and, and teach and how and who we engage with and the research we do and what we build, all of these are choices that we as engineers are making that have deeply, you know, political um, implications and they empower different groups differently. We need to remember that. And so how do we align engineering work um, uh, with directly advancing these causes of environmental protection justice, peace, and human rights at the scale that is necessary. And so that brings me to the title of the talk, Building Structures for Activist Engineering. And the reason why I named the talk Building Structures for Activist Engineering is because it would force me to think about what do we do about it? <laughs> and I don't have any answers to it. Um, and I circle these three words because I wanna, or these three terms because it, they bear death defining, right? Building structures and activist engineering. And I use each one of those terms in a very specific way. Building, of course, is something that engineers do all the time. We build things, right? It's a matter of what we decide to build. Structures, I'm gonna define in just a moment, um, as well as activist engineering. Um, I'll start with activist engineering first. Um, activist engineering is something that I mentioned I've been thinking about for um, a few years and I coined it activist engineering perhaps because I was a graduate student at the time and I was a student activist at the University of Michigan and I was like, 
let's just call it activist engineering. Um, activist engineering is about having engineers make explicit the values and the key drivers of why engineering is done and having that knowledge shape how engineering is done. It's about fundamentally, as I say in, in the paper that's cited there at the bottom, fundamentally redefining contemporary engineering practice by exposing this political and value-based nature of the work we do, by applying social and ecological learning to technological design, and by imbuing a different sense of responsibility in engineers by moving the scope of engineering beyond solely technological development. So the goal of activist engineering is to get engineers to ask and have a conversation about the question, what is the real problem? And does this problem, quote unquote, require an engineering solution? If an engineer can ask this question, that means, um, can answer this question, I should say, that means that they can confidently ask this question and have the tools to answer it. And if they can ask this question that converts them from an order taker, which most engineers are in the end order takers, to someone who is actively engaged and will likely have a vested stake in the system being designed. So uh, the next couple of slides, and I'm, uh, I hope to not bore you with um, a lot of theoretical language here, but I, I, I'm using these terms specifically. And my postdoctoral fellow um, who just left is a sociologist, and he made me think very, very critically about the way in which I use words. Um, and one of the words that he made me start thinking about is structures. Um, now, in sociology, um, structures focus specifically on macro level things in society. Uh, and they um, are uh, constituted by basically social forces and patterns of relationships, institutionalized relationships between different parts of society. Within sociology, there are a handful of important structures uh, that have been researched for a long time, right? Again, these are social forces that shape who we are. So they've studied family, religion, education, media, law, politics, and economy. And I circle education, law, politics, and economy because those are the kinds of things that perhaps engineers, uh, engineering educators, and academics perhaps might be influenced directly by or think more about. What's important about structures is that they organize the relationships that we have with each other, um, and they create patterns in these relationships hierarchies of who has more power than other than other people or what institutions or organizations have more power than others um, and uh, it gives us an ability to understand these power differentials now you know we can take this to the context of engineering and say that um, or ask what are the kinds of structures that shape what engineering actually is right we can talk about primary education we can talk about the pipeline that feeds engineering schools. We can talk about the way in which engineering schools like Arizona State's University's engineering school or Michigan's engineering school or the, the school that you're affiliated with in Glasgow, what the relationship your school has with different companies and government agencies and the way in which all of that is influenced by science and technology policy, okay? As individuals, we, um, we go through these structures. These structures shape the choices that are available to us, what we think is possible, right? It, it sort of dictates what the bounds of acceptability and unacceptability are within our profession, right? So perhaps um, it is acceptable to talk about the way in which uh, you can use the Navier-Stokes equations and a new kind of differential equation solving method to uh, uh, design more efficient, um, uh, more aerodynamically efficient uh, wingtips that um, are on a plane, or that could be part of a missile system, right? It's okay to talk about that. But then, you know, is it okay to say, wait, don't missiles kill people? Why are we doing this? Oftentimes those kinds of conversations are not okay to have, right? So these social structures and the norms shape what is acceptable and unacceptable, right? And then the last point that I wanna make here 
um, yeah, relates to do with the how I feel like a lot of the focus of a lot of research has been on organic versus um, uh, uh, sort of more structural aspects uh, that shape engineering. So how much of the change that we are expecting engineering to take on or younger people at students to take on is um, unfairly burdensome on them, right? Engineering students might be leaving college and entering these structures that limit their ability to think differently about what they can do and what the possibilities are, right? And so we're sort of training engineers to fight a very, very, very big fight, right? So to think about how we might have these issues unfold at larger scales or be addressed at larger scales, I really do think it's important we think about economic incentives a little bit more explicitly. So last slide here where I define a few terms. Again, just to give you a sense of what I'm trying to get at with structures. So there are three other notions within sociology called fields, capital, and habitus. And I'm just going to take them one by one very quickly. Um, fields are basically the arenas in which people express and reproduce who they are and what they care about and how they think, right? And it's within these fields that people compete for different kinds of resources, right? And in fields, there are networks of people. So we can broadly think about engineering as a field right, in which engineers who have been trained as engineers go in and do what engineers do, whatever that is, right. And in our work, um, we use the knowledge and resources that we have in different kinds of ways. And we're part of a network of people, right. I'm a part of a network that's affiliated with ASME. Capital is something that you've probably heard a lot about in different kinds of contexts. And they're basically accumulated resources that you can use and that you can exchange. Economic capital, fairly obvious, right? The work that we do generates revenue, it generates profit, it creates certain kinds of wealth. That wealth is accumulated in different companies or, or different governments, right? The three others are perhaps a little bit less obvious um, to a technically trained audience like me, for example. I had to think about these things a little bit more. Right? Social capital has to do with networks of relationships, right? As an engine, as an aerospace engineer, I am part of a network of other aerospace engineers, right? And the fact that I have a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan gives me a credential in which I can operate in this network in a way that people understand me or I'm accepted. Cultural capital is a, is a little bit different in that it has to do with how we think about um, what is happening in society. So think about the, the weight that Elon Musk has in society, right? Um, there is culture, the, he does work that shapes the way we think as engineers, right? You can think about that as cultural capital. And lastly, there's symbolic capital. Imagine if you, as an engineer or scientist, won the Nobel Prize for physics, right? That gives you a certain kind of prestige and honor and recognition that you can use now. You can trade that. You can enter spaces that you perhaps couldn't have entered before. So those are four different ways in which you think about capital. And again, I'll get to why I'm, I'm defining these terms in just a moment. The last thing is a kind of obscure word called habitus, which is basically the norms or tendencies that guide our behavior and thinking, right? As we go through engineering school, we are trained and socialized and conditioned in particular ways, right? We gain capacities and skills and we lose capacities and skills, right? Research is showing that as engineers go through their undergraduate curriculum, they care less and less about public welfare, okay? So we form a particular set of norms and ways of being. And the reason why I bring all of this up is to really start thinking about what an alternative field of collaboration could look like. What would it even, can we even think about it? So, you know, I've mentioned that there's a field of engineering and science with related capitals, economic, social, cultural, and symbolic and habitus. And this is sort of the dominant, um, the dominant um, uh, or the status quo of engineering, right? And as I mentioned, I care about engaging with those who lack access to engineering services. And oftentimes those, uh, those folks are organized in community groups, 
right? And they have their own set of capitals, right? They fundraise differently. They have different kind of wealth. They have different kind of networks. They have different kinds of cultural and symbolic capital. And oftentimes there can be a mismatch. What works in engineering does not work in this other space, right? And perhaps many of you who uh, engage in on the ground work in, in different kinds of cultural contexts realize that what is valued as currency in engineering is not valued as currency in the, the local community that you're working in, right? This is basically what I'm trying to get at here, right? Can we imagine, however, a field of collaboration where there is a new kind of overlap that defines or is defined by different economic, social, cultural, and symbolic capital, where it how we generate revenue, what we consider to be social currency in this space is different. And if we can start conceiving of a new field, we can really start imagining what should constitute it, what can support it, right? What are the structures that need to be in place for us to build out this new field? So I'm almost done with my remarks. Uh, this is the penultimate slide. So I want to throw out four premises to help us build something new. Premise number one, volunteerism and pro bono efforts are only going to bite at the margins. The reason why I say that is because doing work through volunteerism and pro bono is incommensurate with the scale of the challenges that we face and the way in which engineering needs to be turned. Second point, most people do not want to be entrepreneurs. Okay, there's been a significant focus on entrepreneurship within engineering curricula, at least within the United States, right? That's great. I think entrepreneurship is wonderful. It, it's, it builds different kinds of skills, but most people want to just show up at career fair and get a job in doing something that they want to do, right? A sole focus on entrepreneurship overlooks um, the way in which we are conditioned as engineers and the risk that entrepreneurship actually takes. To be able to, to be an entrepreneur um, requires you to do something that other people haven't done before. And at least within the United States where student debt is a big issue, there, most people might be unwilling to take that risk. And they just wanna sign up for a job that gives them a living wage, okay? Premise number three, we cannot focus only on how students are being educated, okay? The reason why I say that is because it's too organic, it's too long-term. We're not really equipping them with the, the skills and the resources they need to be active political change agents, right? Um, and so what other resources or enthusiasm can we tap into? And I'll share a little bit about what, what I've been trying to do and um, you know, share a little bit about how successful we've been. And the last thing is if we build it, they will come, okay? And this goes back to desire. There is a strong desire on the part of engineers to want to do this kind of work. We built the Constellation Prize. We're just like, let's just do this and let's see what happens. And it turns out that people care. So this just gives you a sense of the, the ways in which we've been doing some projects within re-engineered. And I'll just highlight a couple of them. One is called Project Confluence which basically is trying to mobilize more engineers and scientists to collaborate with community-based organizations in the United States. Um, there are three different aspects to that. One has been focusing on academics and having, that, having um, them collab, focusing on academics and understanding what collaboration actually looks like in a way where power dynamics are, are, are a point of uh, inquiry for us and understanding. The second is with practicing engineers. We're, we're working on a collaboration with Community Engineering Corps, which perhaps some of you already are familiar with. And are again, focusing on practicing engineers, not students, not academics. The last is um, working with retired engineers and help and using their expertise and time and knowledge to help us think about new kinds of business models that can support the work that we do. There's some work that is being funded by the Lemelson Foundation on changing the undergraduate curriculum at Arizona State University. There's some work that I'm doing with uh, the Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Lab to really change the way they think about how they frame technological R&D questions. Right? This, I think, it could be one way that uh, leads to some kind of structural change. Because if you could change the way a federal funding agency thinks about the work it does, 
it shapes, it has a, a significant amount of trickle down effect where faculty members now might start thinking differently about the work that they do. Um, last thing that I'll mention again is the Constellation Prize, um, which is sort of perhaps an expression of the, the cultural and symbolic capital aspects of a, a new field of collaboration. So with that, I end. Um, and I just want to ask, what kinds of structures can we build? What policies need to be advocated for and where in the engineering ecosystem? What kinds of laws can we help write to build new kinds of structures? What kinds of businesses can we help build to move us beyond entrepreneurship? So if I recognize that we need entrepreneurship to start off, but we want to normalize it. Right? We need entrepreneurship to move beyond entrepreneurship. How do we make use of limited resources that exist in this space? I showed you the map of Appalachia. We could, if, we, if I was given $10 million, it's entirely reasonable to spend all $10 million in one community and, and focus on impacts in that one community. But what about the thousand other communities that have similar issues? Is there a way to frame the engineering interventions in ways that use the limited resources in ways that have a larger impact at scale. Um, what resources aren't we leveraging and who else needs to be at the table? And with that, I just want to open it up to conversation. And you can tell me that I am crazy or I'm wrong. You can say whatever you want. All right, <clears throat> let's get into it, Darshan. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I started this uh, seminar. Could you leave that slide up actually? Oh, yes, yes. Because I think that's a good one. Because we can we can discuss some of those. Um, we do have a couple. Uh, so first of all, just to to answer uh, Akiva's question in the in the chat itself, um, to contact you, Darshan. You can either contact Darshan through Engineering for Change. You can send it to us, and we can contact any of our seminar speakers forward stuff along. Uh, but I believe his contact information was on the first slide. But it would also, uh, is there any way that you would prefer them to contact Yeah, you? I'll just I'll just put in my email address in the chat. All right, perfect. So you can contact him directly as well. Um, but I wanna get to some of these questions. We're getting a lot here in the Q&A. So this is, when I started this seminar, um, we really wanted to bring in people uh, with ideas to have a space where we could have this conversation because I do think that we are constructing, we are hoping to construct new uh, modalities of engineering perhaps and in, in, in your language you're, you're saying these like fields of collaboration uh, and habitus um, and so I think this is a really great um, dialogue that we need to be having in engineering. Um, I'm going to ask, synthesize some of these questions. I have so many questions that I think we're just gonna have to set a separate meeting uh -huh. because I'm so excited about talking with you about this but let's go to the Q&A. Um, so, so Valhawk asks, why do you think the status quo for engineers as order takers, why does that exist, right? And so for example, I think that you, um, in, in my language, I would think about objectives. And so you were talking about the credentials or capital, like what you are trying to get out of your job, right? Mm -hmm. Or why you're doing what you're doing. And I think that uh, when you talk about, let's say, defense technologies, right? Mm -hmm. So a missile, mm -hmm. I know that I have chosen not to work on missiles, mm -hmm. right? Like that's my, my objective was like, I want my efforts. Uh, that's not an interesting problem to me, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. someone else might be interested in that problem. Um, you know, is it, are you saying that engineers should not be working on missiles? Or, or what is what is the question? If someone wants to work on, I really care about national defense, and therefore mm -hmm. I want to make the best possible missile, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm going to spend 30 years of my career is just getting new missile technologies mm -hmm. for defense. Mm -hmm. This is an essential defense thing. Yep. What is sort of yep. your response to that that structure? And I have a response, but I'm interested yeah. in your response. So. Um... Uh, I'm glad this question is brought up. I mean, it, it is central, right? Especially because like most, a lot of engineering is driven by this. You know, fundamentally it's, it's a question about values, right? What are the values that we hold? Um, what are, and, and how are those values shaped? Um, uh, and people hold different values. I, I can't argue with that. 
right? Like if somebody feels like something else is more important, they're going to spend their time doing that, right? Um, I would just simply say um, that it is worth, and even me, like me as somebody who shares or who has shared these kinds of thoughts, I'm constantly questioning my values and what I believe and the assumptions that I'm making. And I feel like uh, what activist engineering is about is just questioning yourself and questioning the values. And if you, at the end of the day, through your you know, complicated thought process, feel like, you know what? I still can justify the work that I do. Here are the moral arguments for it. Here are the trade-offs that I'm willing to make. Then I, I can't argue with that, right? I think it's, it's about whether or not we as engineers are thinking very, very critically about what, for example, the public is in public welfare. Who's, who is the public, right? We use that term a lot, right? Is it just me and the people who look like me, right? Is it future generations, right? So, um, so that's one thing. It's just simply about questioning all the terms that we use, the words that we think, the values that we hold. The second thing that, I, uh, that I'll say is um, uh, because I'm in the School for the Future of Innovation in, in Society, I've been thinking a lot about the word future. And we as engineers design technologies that of course could have an implication or a set of implications now, but they have a set of implications for the future that we don't know, right? With capital investments, with infrastructures that we build, they're gonna be there for a long time. Now the question then arises is what kinds of thoughts and feelings and emotions and values do I want people in the future to hold, right? If, I, if we continue to invest in, let's just say nuclear weapons, right? That means we're making the assumption or we are setting people up 20, 30, 40 years from now to be thinking about and dealing with nuclear weapons and all the crap that comes with nuclear weapons. Right? So the investments that we are making are not just for now, they're shaping the possibilities of peace and justice and, and you know, a, a verdant world in the future. And I think that needs to be incorporated into how we think about what we do as well. So Darshan, you're, you're touching on a topic and I'm gonna jump around the Q&A here a little bit and try and synthesize because we have a lot of questions. You have generated a lot of questions and luckily you left a lot of time for us to have this discussion. So I'm really <laughs> excited about it. Um, you're right now talking about the future, and I think that one of the big questions is that sustainability, and we can define sustainability in different ways, but in my mind, the three pillars of sustainability are economic impact, social mm -hmm. impact, and environmental impact, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the literature broadly generalized. Um, the outcomes for sustainability, the outcomes for peace and justice that you're talking about, the outcomes for environmental are on the order of years, if not decades, as you're discussing, mm -hmm. right? The, the techniques that we use and analysis that we use in engineering currently are on the order of, I'm going to sell you something next week, right? Or like several years from now, yeah. I'm gonna have a product in the market, or I have this thing that I'm building right now, or I'm working on right yeah. now, right? Um, so I guess the question comes up, you know, how do you deal with this difference? So you talked about scale, in terms of like, uh, I, I, I interpreted it as scale of components, like pieces uh -huh. of the system. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. I think there's a question of scale in terms of engineering techniques mm -hmm. that has to do with time scale, where mm -hmm. we're evaluating things. What is the strength? What is the force right now, right? What is the functionality right yeah. now, yeah. right? Yeah. And we predict those things. We say, okay, you know, if I build yeah. this thing, it will have this functionality when I use it. Yeah. You yeah. don't say, what is the impact of this on social society 30 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're not, we don't have the, I don't believe we necessarily, we have some of that for environmental stuff, we're building that. Mm -hmm. But I think of the, the issues you brought yeah. up, yeah, like how this is gonna affect community organizations 30 years from now, like my drill, you know, I, I don't know, and I, yeah. I don't even have any way to even think about that. So I wonder this question of time scales. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you address this if you want to be an activist engineer? How do you address this difference? I'm doing engineering, like the traditional yeah. engineering I know, but I want to think about its impact on a very long time scale. So how do you how do you approach that? 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, you know, a simplistic answer, and I use the word simplistic, not simple. A simplistic answer is, um, you know, uh, what are the what are the constraints that we are working with, or what are the objectives of the design, right? If we can maybe reframe the objectives of the design, maybe we think a little bit differently. I mean, I think I've been thinking about this, especially with renewable energy technology, right? Like we are designing, you know, um, uh, very sophisticated electrical systems, electronic systems um, that have particular lifespans that are going to be creating a whole other set of fairly insidious environmental and social challenges 20 years from now, right? And we're doing it because we're, you know, we're trying to deal with climate change and all that. Um, and I don't know the extent to which people are saying like, you know what, like the more and more we electrify things, the more and more we, in which we design things in ways that they are not reusable or recyclable or whatever, like we are, creating a different kind of toxic. We're trading one problem for another. Can, it, can, can, can I, can I, just, I I'm, go, go ahead, Ayana. I wanted to thanks, ask a Q&A. Thank, thank you so much, Jesse. Yeah, no, I I just, I, I kind of want to layer onto that, Dr. And I really appreciate first and foremost, your, your, your honesty in saying, you know, we don't have all the answers for this yet, but I'm curious about uh, the role or the connectivity to frankly existing frameworks and methodologies that we advocate for actively mm -hmm. within EGD or engineering uh -huh. global development, yeah. particularly like human-centered design, which allow us to really focus on the end user and to unpack potential unintended consequences right at the beginning of the design process. Or uh, for example, connecting some of the work we're doing within engineering to frameworks like the sustainable development goals, which also broaden the lens and, and really start to help us to think through the the societal impacts of what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. So any, and th this is to me where I think, I, I also wanna see what your heavy questions of what laws need to be written, what policies can we advocate for? I want to understand yeah. how we are linking to this larger ecosystem. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I was able to tease out a question and what you were saying. <laughs> can I, let me, let, me, let, me, let me try and rephrase. So yeah. I think because this address this is a question that I think is several of the Q and Q and A in the in the Q and A yeah. Uh, chats. Yeah. Is you've talked about structures. We need to build new structures, right? Yeah. But there are existing structures which yeah. I yeah. think yeah. Uh, are affecting all of these things you're talking about. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. you know I may not be designing to my values because yeah. I need money to eat because I live yes. in a capitalist system, right? Yeah. Yeah. And because people in my field credentialize and value uh, you know, new per technical performance or innovative technical performance. Like why is Elon Musk like the cool, like what is cool engineering? What is aspirational engineering? These are all things that are like vested power structures yeah. in the status quo that mm -hmm. if you're like, oh, well we should be working on environmental things. I, you know, I had a review recently on a paper where they were like, well, why would the company care about this? Right, like you said, yeah. the company is there to make money. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and so how do you think about like if we want to build these new structures, yeah. you're not doing it on a blank slate. So yes. uh, um, how, yeah, yeah, how, yeah. how do you interact with if we want to change the system, yeah. but you're yeah. within a system that wants to maintain the status quo? What yeah. is the what is that tension? What is the way forward? What are actions you might take to to um, try and build structures locally? Does that okay, address yeah, your question? I, I, I get it, Anna? I get it, okay. So um, I'll just say two things. Um, one is uh, going back to the question about futures. There are some interesting things that are happening globally that I think we can learn from. So for example, um, in Wales, they have a political representative who represents the future. They have an office, right? There are ways in which people in Japan have been thinking differently about how the values or the kinds of things that people might care about in the future need to be brought into decision making now. And if we think about universal design and like human centered design, and you know, there's evidence to show that it just leads to better design, right? Um, maybe thinking about the future and enfolding that into how we think about design and universality could lead to better Im impact now, not just for the future, but for now. Okay, now to, to your question um, related to interaction with the new and the existing. Um, 
there's no way to get around the fact that there people have been socialized in a particular way and we we have certain norms and expectations what we are trying to do is simply try to create some kind of alternative start somewhere and see who signs up and hopefully over time um that leads to i feel like i'm being very vague right now um so okay i'm working with i'm working with some retired engineers um to see whether or not we can design an engineering firm and monetize its work in a way where people who lack access to those services in the united states can afford those services i don't know whether it's possible or not but we're trying to build it and if we build it um it might take a few years to start up right but can we get to the point where people uh, a somebody can go to a career fair and say i can make $90,000 working for oil and gas company x with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and i can make close to $90,000 working on human rights as an engineer i don't think that like basically what i'm trying to say there is we're trying to build something that does not assume that people will be willing to sacrifice uh pay to do the work that they care about and the goal i think that sort of the pie in the sky is to design a firm or you know if hopefully by us doing it other people are going to experiment with it as well right design a firm where no we sh people should be paid $100,000 to work on social justice it shouldn't be that oh you have to like work at you know minimum wage to do this kind of work so if we can create that then you're presenting a viable choice for somebody and i think that if we can create a viable choice then we perhaps have accomplished something significant that's all i can say sure that well this this is a great conversation darshan i have one last question and then or is it yana should i turn it over to you right now what do you think no 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 please go ahead i think there's okay. a, a rich dialogue so and there's, there's a lot, a of, lot questions of questions in the Q &A. here yeah. there's so many questions in this q and a and um we're going to send all of these to you darshan in writing oh, great. great and great, so great. then when we post the recording of this seminar you we can have your written responses right next to it yeah. So any of the questions I've tried to synthesize some of like the main ideas in these Q&A to, to get to these questions that we're talking about right now. Uh, but obviously, that's my interpretation of them. Yeah. So I want to make sure, especially with the precision that you're bringing to this this language and the methods from sociology and et cetera, that you have a chance to say, OK, like for this question, this is how I would address it. These are my thoughts. Yeah. And we can get those right next to the recording of the seminar. So that's the first thing. And yeah. also for anyone who's who, who's written any of those questions. Um, one of the things that that uh, struck me listening to you talk is that uh, you talked about engineers like we engineers, engineers as a group of people, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And I, I, I agree that engineers, I think, really engineering, being an engineer is a central part of people's identity when they have these credentials within our current field. Yeah. Right. And you know, in other countries, my, my experience has been in other systems that engine being an engineer means different things. Yes. Right. Yes. And even in the US, I would argue that most academics are not professional engineers. Yes. And and perhaps, you know, someone who graduates with a bachelor's, they're an engineer. Like yes. what makes you an engineer? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and I also think that a lot of these questions, when you talk about credentialing and network and knowledge and these barriers part of it is who is an engineer currently based on the structures that we currently have yes right yeah um and you know i don't know that if it's necessarily about how we're teaching students um but i think an interesting question is what is the uh, and one of, that one of my students worked on is what is what does it mean what is the context of the engineer uh -huh. that that in in addressing a particular problem and how does that change how they do solve that problem uh -huh, uh -huh. right so in different companies you might address the same problem even with the same values differently yes um and it's not like this physics apolitical thing that you're discussing i think that yeah. we already are doing those we're just not discussing them yes right 
Yes. Um, so I thought your thoughts on what it means to be an engineer and the qualities and how that might change as we move towards activist engineering. Oh, gosh. Um, how can I summarize it quickly? I mean, first of all, I do want to recognize what you said, Jesse, that the cultures of engineering are different, not only um, you know, within different disciplines, like mechanical engineers versus aero versus electrical or whatever, right? But we know from cultural studies and engineering studies that what engineering is in Sweden is different than what it is in Japan, is different than what it is in love, right? So I, I, I understand that, want to recognize that. Um, uh, <laughs> I guess, um, let, me, let me pose this yeah. question. So if we just think about disciplines, right? Yes. Yes. And you talk about disciplines you think might have more of an environmental bent, let's say civil and environmental engineering. Yes. I would argue that the other identities of people within civil and environmental engineering, the demographics of those yes. disciplines are quite different than ones that have different values. And that yeah. perhaps the values are leading to people to self-select into different disciplines, to stay yeah. or continue in that discipline. Yes. And therefore perhaps maybe a reinforcing thing. So that's a structure that you were discussing, yeah. yes. right? And yeah. so, um, you know, I was wondering like how you thought about the interaction between who you are yes. and then also engineering training because you were talking about engineers as a group. Yes. And I think that yeah. there's just different types of engineers. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I'm not sure if I can like actually answer your question because I feel like you're making a, a fairly axiomatic statement um, and there's not like, it's hard to argue that, right? Um, and so, uh, I will sort of maybe riff on it a little bit to simply say that what you are raising is about diversity, equity, and inclusion in a very interesting kind of way, because um, uh, there are particular kinds of issues that people want come to engineering to try to solve, right? And the dominant paradigm or the structures that exist only solve particular sets of problems. And we equip engineers with particular mentalities, right? And what that means is that people leave engineering because they feel like it's better that they're, they feel like being a lawyer is gonna be better than them being an engineer, right? Be, so if you wanna affect, you know, indigenous rights in the United States or whatever, right? Like some people might say, you know, I'm gonna leave engineering because this just is so dominant in a particular worldview and set of ideas that maybe a legal training is gonna be more beneficial. So to be able to address these kinds of challenges, environmental human rights challenges, requires those people to be a part of what we're trying to do in engineering, which requires us to then design different kinds of structures so that they can see themselves in it. So there's sort of this like reflexivity between the structures that we have, the, the diversity, the intellectual diversity that is brought to engineering and the problems that engineering can adequately be involved in addressing. And I'm not saying in the end that engineers, like engineers have all of the answers, but I do feel like engineering mentality and thinking and training is widely applicable in a, a whole bunch of different social and political contexts that we need to have those structures in place so that we expand the diversity to be able to solve the kinds of problems that need solving. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. I think the, the last thing I'll say here, and I'm turning it over to Yana, is not a question. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate uh, really delving into discussing values. I'm a design researcher. And so I really think about value rather than performance, right? So mm -hmm. I think design is about value rather than about mm -hmm. performance. So what is this worth to the person that we're designing it for? Yeah. And how do we think about that? And I yeah. think that as engineers, I think what you're bringing up, bringing some of these techniques and language from sociology and other, other disciplines is this idea that we should be maybe thinking about the philosophy of engineering and the philosophy yeah. of science a little bit more deeply and explicitly when we think about engineering. And we've made a lot of decisions as a discipline in that space, but we don't discuss it. Don't so discuss even it. discussing it in this way and having the language to discuss it and the spaces to discuss it uh, is really important. So I really wanna thank you for that contribution um, to, to start us having this discussion in this way. So, uh, I really, and the precision of the language. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over to Yana now because I could talk for hours about this. <laughs> and I, I, I do just, 10 rounds, one applause. Can I just quickly say that um, 
I welcomed the conversation. So I wasn't able to like directly interact with the people answering the, asking the questions. So please email me, happy to talk by Zoom or email. Like, I feel like this just needs to be bigger discussion. <laughs> I wanna talk about it and question all the assumptions that I have and question the assumptions that you have and that we have about what we're trying to do. All right, well, thank, thank you, you very so much, Darshan. I, I wanna thank everyone for the questions and I'm gonna turn it over to right. Yana. Yana, please. Thank you, thank you, Jesse. And thank you, Darshan. I, we are over time, but I think it was time incredibly well spent. Um, I, I, I can't echo enough how critical these conversations are and uh, how much we appreciate the time you've taken to spend with us. And frankly, I see this as an opportunity for us to really arrive at some shared value and uh, we at E4C are, are really eager to provide the platform for us to do that. Um, obviously you've crowded in and brought in a lot of uh, really interested uh, participants today. The questions have been incredibly rich. And I think uh, from the detail, you can see that the folks that are attending today's seminar how, are thinking about these issues also from all parts of the world. So it, it's an indicator that perhaps the tide is shifting and that it's time for us to collectively have this dialogue and, and challenge the traditional notions under, under which engineering has been governed. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. I know nobody else wants to hear and more bombastic comments. The recording of this, of this seminar will be available on our platform. Questions will be addressed directly next to that seminar. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Please do join us also for the conversation coming up on May 3rd. Um, alongside the United Nations Science, Technology, Innovation Forum. And with that, I'm going to wish you all uh, a good afternoon, a good evening, a good morning even, depending on where you're joining us from. And stay tuned for the next seminar. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.